Well, uh, we've been spending a bunch of time on graphs, and uh, we're going to move into a new topic now, uh, which is the internet. And um, the internet we can really think of as one big graph. Um, we have all these pages, which we might imagine as nodes, and um, some pages link to other pages. So we could imagine um, those edges being like hyperlinks, right? So for here, I have a hyperlink from page A to page B. And um, so two things I want to talk about that go uh, kind of a lot farther than we went in CS220 is first, how do we scrape, you know, a website or maybe a collection of websites where we kind of have this complicated graph of pages. And we're going to be using the skills we learned with breadth first search and depth first search um, to do this. And then the second thing is um, in CS220, we kind of just dealt with rather simple pages and uh, maybe we might call them static pages. There's not so much happening on them. Um, here I want to talk about kind of more complicated pages and, and I'll kind of introduce how uh, more complicated pages work before we get into that. And so today's focus is really on that second piece. How do we deal with more complicated pages? And then we're going to kind of be coming back full circle and, um, and kind of using our graph algorithms to uh, search a collection of pages. So let's review a little bit from um, the previous course and uh, starting by looking at the document object model or the DOM. Um, and when I'm in a web browser, and let's say I type in a URL and I hit go, um, I'm going to get this response that looks like, like something on the right uh, back from the server, and that's going to get loaded into my browser, right? And, and maybe there's a bunch of HTML there. Um, actually, kind of looking at this carefully, I see that this is the HTML part, and it's inside of a broader response. And this whole thing is an HTTP response, hypertext transfer protocol. This part is a hypertext markup language. And this will kind of tell me other details like, you know, is this a successful page load or is this an error page? Um, it might tell me what kind of content is it? Is it an image or um, is it HTML? Um, what encoding are we using? How long is the page? Lots of details, right? But ultimately this HTML lands back in the browser. And, um, and so it's there. And what the browser will do is it'll construct a tree from uh, from all of this over here, and that tree is, is called the document object model or DOM tree, and um, and so we introduced this in the previous course. But now that you're all familiar with trees, uh, maybe it's going to click for you in a way that you know it's often kind of hard to conceptualize back then. So so I get this tree, and uh, and kind of to zoom in on the tree, I have all of these nodes, and um, and each node, as you can see, is is called an, an element. And elements kind of closely correspond to tags. So for example, I see my, um, you know, my HTML element here comes from the HTML tag. Uh, my body element comes from the body tag, um, so on and so forth. And eventually we're gonna get to see some examples where uh, we might be able to get elements that kind of are not corresponding to any sort of tag in the HTML. Okay, so other parts of this tree um, each of these uh, each of these elements uh, can have attributes. So, for example, um, you know, A stands for anchor, and um, anchors are just hyperlinks. That's how we link from one page to another, and they have to have this href attribute, which actually tells us not only that hey, this piece of text is a link, uh, but here's where it goes to. Um, so we might have that. Um, a lot of these are going to contain uh, text as well. So, for example. Um, you know, H1 contains the text welcome. So I'm kind of drawing that like this over here. And um, and then of course, you know, each element can contain other elements. And we're just gonna use the language of trees here, you know, parent, child, ancestor, descendant, siblings, that kind of thing uh, to, to describe this tree. Now, something I want you to look at here is, is this little piece of code right here. Inside of my um, inside of my uh, HTML page, I have the script tag, and inside of the script tag, I have JavaScript code. And uh, JavaScript is, is not just kind of a simple markup language like HTML, uh, it's more of a full language like Python, right? So I actually have um, some JavaScript code running, and it can do things like make changes uh, to the DOM. So for example, maybe that, uh, maybe that JavaScript code adds this table uh, right here. And, and kind of the thing to think about here is I kind of trace this back, right? This is not in the HTML, right? It got added by that JavaScript code. And and so well, why does that matter for us? Um, 
back in, in the previous course, we learned about this requests module, right? Maybe you would do something like um, import, import requests like this. And then we would say something like request.get. And, and when we do that, we would be getting back, you know, for a given URL, we'd be getting back some HTML, something like this. And, and so the problem is, is that, you know, if that JavaScript adds that table over here, when somebody actually views it in, say, Chrome, we won't see that. We're just going to get all of this stuff and we're going to be missing that data, right? So for there's lots of web pages um, on the internet where writing this kind of code is not going to get us what we, what we hope to get, right? And of course, the web browser will be fine with that, uh, but we're not. And, um, and so what we'd really kind of like to do is, um, is kind of have some sort of JavaScript engine when we're doing our web scraping so we can actually get data like this as well. So there's kind of this simple and complicated web scraping. And so the simple tool is request, which we've already learned. And, uh, and so let's try and look at that, how, how that works down here. So I have two computers. On the left, I have my computer, or maybe it's my laptop or virtual machine, and I'm running Jupyter Notebooks there. And, uh, and I'm doing this request.get. And, uh, and I'm talking to this other computer over here. This computer um, has an IP address, and on that computer, there's this web server. Um, I can send requests like, you know, send me index.html, please. And it'll send me back this, this kind of data here. And if I'm using the request module, well, I could just fetch different types of files, right? Um, I could fetch a JavaScript uh, file, for example, a .js file, uh, but nothing in the request module would know how to actually run that code and, and kind of figure out what it does. Um, well, what does the web browser do if the web browser is fetching this? Well, the web browser, in this case, would try to grab all this HTML, and then it might realize, oh, there's other resources here. I have an image completely separate file, a.png, a script, you know, here's a, here's a, a JavaScript file, completely separate thing. So if I was doing the, the um, you know, working in a web browser, it'd be kind of multiple requests back and forth to get all of those different things, but I don't have any of that here with requests. Okay, so now I'm showing something more complicated, which is uh, Selenium. And uh, Selenium can do this stuff too. It can kind of fetch these basic files, uh, but it's also capable of running JavaScript code in a web browser, and if that JavaScript code modifies the DOM, say by you know adding some new elements, then I can convert the new DOM back to HTML and, and read that. So then I kind of have some hope of getting this extra content um, kind of out of out of the page if I'm using Selenium. And, and so when I'm looking at this here, there's a few parts to Selenium. Um, one, you can see I'm importing the Selenium uh, module, and where I have to install that with pip. Um, we also have this separate program on the computer called a Chrome driver. And then finally, we actually have uh, the Chrome web browser. And, and so the way this kind of works is that the Selenium is going to use the driver, and then the driver is going to use uh, the web browser. So I'm going to come back to that a little bit and kind of talk about how we're going to install those things. Uh, but let me show you the benefits of this, kind of the kinds of pages we're going to be dealing with. Um, so what I've done is on the website, I've uh, the course website, I've created all of these kind of nasty uh, web pages that are hard to get the data off of, and um, and we're going to use Selenium to kind of pull off the data from all of these and a bunch of examples. So in this first one, you see there's one table, and then after one second, um, another one gets added by JavaScript. Let me just refresh that again. I get this. And there's a second one. And so if I was using the requests module, I'd only ever be able to read uh, this first table. But when I'm using Selenium, I'm going to be able to grab both of these. Let's look at another one. You've probably seen lots of um, pages like this where maybe there's some data and you have to click, keep hitting show more uh, to get the more additional content and then eventually it gets done. Um, what I'd like to do is to somehow simulate that button click, right? It's all on the same page but I somehow have to automate that click in order to get all of the data. Um, here's one uh, that you have to be a little careful with. Um, you know, some, some content on the internet is kind of backed by accounts and you maybe have to create an account and have a password uh, before you can use it. So, so let me just, I can't remember my password. Was it secret? Um, nope, I guess I named um, my password after my dog Fido. So let me try that again. I'm gonna say Fido. 
and uh, boom, there's all of my table and I can download it. And you have to be careful with this one because <clears throat> often when you create an account online, they might have some sort of um, user agreement that you're signing. And sometimes those user agreements will say, um, you can't do the kind of thing I did just now. So be careful and make sure you're not breaking any laws. Of course, on this web page that I've created, you're more than welcome to kind of play with it and uh, automatically enter passwords. But um, some sites, they'll make you agree not to do that uh, when you create the account. Um, the last one here is maybe the site has some kind of query. And if I say something like, you know, 1950, it might show me all of the hurricanes that occurred in that year. If I say 1951, Yes, that was a good year. No hurricanes. 1952, there's one. 1953. And, and so you might imagine that I want to automatically type different years in and search. And if I can do that, well, then I can ultimately pull out all of the data. All of these things are, are things that the requests module um, would be bad at. So the first thing we have to think about um, when we want to use Selenium is how to install it. <coughs> and, um, and so I have some examples here, right? There are these three pieces. Um, the easiest piece is just, you know, the Python module, right? I could say pip3 install Selenium. Uh, and that's going to be using the Chrome driver, though, which ends up using the web browser. Um, the web browser, to kind of go to the last step, is kind of simple as well. I can just run this, sudo apt install Chromium browser, and, um, and then I would be fine. Uh, so, so I think you can figure out these two, right? That piece and that piece. The more complicated thing is actually installing uh, installing this Chrome driver, okay? And uh, and because the Chrome driver has to match ma match up the versions uh, with the web browser, so let me you know I have this kind of here as a reference, but I'm actually going to head over to a terminal and uh, and actually show you how to do this install. All right, so I'm I'm here. I'm going to do my SSH. <clears throat> that should come up in just a minute. And um, and I've already installed the Chromium uh, browser, right? So I've already done this. And, and so the first thing I want to do is I want to figure out, well, what version do I have? So I'm going to copy this here. I'm going to say Chromium browser dash version. And, um, and, and really, I just kind of care about this major version. So I, I can see I'm on version 85 of Chrome. Uh, we're not going to worry about this right here. So so what I can tell from this is that I need to get version 85 of the Chrome driver. <clears throat> and so I'm gonna head back here, and that's on this page, Chromium driver download. So I'm gonna open this thing, and uh, and I can see they have different versions. Um, I want version 85 because that was what I just saw on my virtual machine. I wouldn't want version 86, that's too new. I have to get version 85, so I'm going to click on that, and uh, and you see they have these different things here. Um, in some of my demos, I may be running uh, running uh, Selenium on my Mac, right? So for that, I had to do I'd install this one right here, the second one. Um, I'm not going to really talk how to uh, try to talk through how I set that up. The only thing I'm going to do here is try to talk through how we would install it. On the virtual machine. So what I see is that I need this file, and so I'm going to right-click on it and say copy link address. So I'm going to do that, and then I'm over here, and um, and you know what? I already downloaded something with that name before. Uh, I guess it's right here. So I'm going to delete that thing first. I'm going to remove. You know, you probably don't already have it, so you don't have to do that. But I'm going to remove the old version, and then you know I had copied the link here, right? So I want to download that. So I'm going to say wget and, um, and then I'm going to download that thing like so. And uh, let me see. I can see it's here. So I'm going to unzip that thing. So I'm going to say unzip. I'm going to paste that. And I can see that it created this file right here, this Chromium driver. Right? Let me just say ls. And, uh, and there it is right there. So I can say something like dot slash you know, Chromium driver Maybe I'll say dash dash version, and I can see it's version 85, which is good. Um, now, what I want to do is I want to put this file, you know, this whole file is a program. I want to put it somewhere on my computer where I can run it no matter what directory I'm in. I can run it now because my current working directory is the same place where that file lives, okay? 
Um, on Linux, we have this thing called the path variable. The way you see the path variable is you say echo dollar path. And it has all these paths here. It has like this, has this. They're separated by colons. For each of these, it's a place that um, that my computer will look when I try to run run a name, when I try to run a program. And, um, and so what I want to do is this Chrome driver program should end up in one of these. And maybe I'll just put in that first one. So I'm going to say move Chrome driver to this place, this first place that I have, just like that. And yours is going to be a little bit different, right? Because your username um, is not TRH. You know, actually this whole piece here is just my home directory. So kind of if I want to make this general for anybody, I might just say tilde. Tilde is another name for the home directory. So I'm going to do that. And that'll be there now. And so now if I run a command like this, if I say which Chrome driver, um, this is a program that helps me figure out where other programs live. And it's going to tell me that uh, it's finding it in this place right here. And, and so now it doesn't matter what directory I am on, on my computer, it's going to find it. I'm going to say something like Chrome uh, driver dash dash version. And, uh, and it works beautifully. And I have the same version as... Uh, as Chrome, right? If I kind of go back to Chromium uh, browser version, I can see that kind of these minor versions are a little bit different. I guess, you know, just like this is 83 and 87, that doesn't really matter. The main thing is that the 85s match up um, in this circumstance. Okay, so if you need TA help or office hour help, um, you know, I think I or the TAs or the mentors are help happy to help you get this installed on your computer. So coming back here, I just want to kind of talk a little bit about the architecture of this system and explain um, explain why we would want to have this separate Chrome thing, like why we couldn't have one piece. And um, kind of what we're trying to do is uh, Selenium wants people to be able to have many different programming languages. I mean, we have Python, but they want to support Java and Ruby and JavaScript, all these different languages, and they all have a different module um, uh, for kind of using them. And, uh, and in the same way, we want to be able to uh, kind of control different web browsers, right? Maybe we want to contr control Chrome or Firefox or, or Edge. And, and what they kind of are trying to avoid is they don't want to write a piece of software for Python and Chrome and then write another piece of software for Java and Chrome and then write another piece of software for Python and Firefox. And, um, and so what they did is they kind of have all these Chrome drivers and all of these Chrome drivers have the same um, interface, right? So kind of you could talk to any different drivers in the same way. And so there's kind of like this centralization point, right? So all the modules know how to talk to this interface and all the drivers implement that interface. And uh, and that kind of saves a lot of time, right? Then we can kind of mix and match any programming language uh, and any driver we want. Okay, so hopefully that's installed and in, in kind of you, it makes sense why it's a complicated process that it wasn't kind of unnecessarily complicated, but they had a good reason for it. In the next video, we'll actually be kind of diving in and doing some of these demonstrations.